Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I am very pleased to be joined by two of the best friends of this podcast, Yegi Resign, who we had on recently to talk about Iran, and Jason Resign, uh, obviously the host of 544 Days, like one of the best podcasts we've had on Crooked. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Great to be back. Thank you. Um, so I-, I mentioned this to you guys before, but we've done a couple of like listeners' questions uh, episodes recently, and the highest volume has been about Iran and just wanting to know more, and I think wanting to feel some solidarity with people there. And some of this was probably in response to your appearance, Yegi. But, and I should say, by the way, should, proper introduction, Yegi's with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Jason, of course, you can find him at the Washington Post. Yegi, I, I wanted to take this to all the way back to mm-hmm. kind of the beginning, right? To, to take people deep inside how we got to where we are today, how it feels to Iranians, and then obviously talk about where this, this protest movement may be going. You're born in the, the 80s. Um, right. Jason and I are a little older. Um, and I, I'm just curious, like, what is it like as you're coming into consciousness of your surroundings, what did you think that the Islamic Republic, uh, which was relatively young when you were growing up, was? And, and, and how did you think about your place as a girl in this system that clearly had different rules for girls than boys? Right. Going back deep, I think one of the first early memories of of being a product of Islamic Republic was that, um, first of all, when I was five years old, I had to go take the, the mock shot that you need for registering at school and um, for preschool, which I started the next year. So this is the summer of I am five and a half. And then my mom had to wanted to take me to do photography. Um, and I had to wear a scarf because this is going to be a photo that is going to be used during my school education years for the time being. And I had to wear the scarf. And this, despite seeing my mom growing up until I was five, that she always wore the scarf and the the cover, body cover, manteau. Um, it never occurred to me that there will be a time that I had to do it. Like, it's mm-hmm. going to be my turn. Yeah. And on that day, um, she she didn't buy me a proper size scarf, so she put hers on me. And this was, like, extremely long <laughs> yeah. and huge. So I have this photo that every time I, I look, it just breaks my heart um, seeing myself. I looked ridiculous. I was this very tiny, super thin um, little girl and this scarf was like up to my knees. So mm-hmm. it was serving as both the, um, the scarf and the cover. And when I saw myself in in, in the, um, the photography shop, I felt like terrible that, oh my God, this is like from now on my life. Um, Did your parents it, like talk to you about that or like how do they tell you that hey there are going to be these rules if you're a girl um we used to watch lots of news like tv was on all the time in our house maybe uh in part because of the war so everyone was watching news um um but but my dad never talked about it i guess it didn't he didn't care he it's not that he didn't care that he was raising girls. Like everyone was so during those years struggling with so many other economic, financial, the the war, yeah. the post revolution. Um and then my dad my mom would every now and then say things, but again, it was as if they have accepted their fate. Yeah. Um, like it felt as if my mom came to peace with it that this is it and she has to do it and we are girls and we have to follow her so she was always telling us that when you leave the house you have to do this and otherwise there will be problems Um, but another early memory that made me think about I'm being raised somewhere that is a little bit different from the rest of the world Mm -hmm. Uh, is when I started school at seven years old, first grade, every morning on the classes, I was at a school that had one of each class, like first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth and fifth, like the primary school. Every morning we had to line up in the in the backyard of the school and one of the teachers would be on the podium and say good morning, da-da-da, and we had to sing the national anthem and... Um, 
then we had to chant the slogan of death to America, death to Israel, and death yeah. to Britain. That was like every morning, three times what, what do you, each. What does a seven-year-old think of that means? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So to me, um, I remember I came, com- like coming home and asking my mom that, why are these our enemies? What is the problem? Why do we have to keep, keep saying so? Um, and then remembering telling my mom that I want to go to America and Israel and Britain and see it myself. Like, yeah. what are these places? Why why do we have to keep saying that? So that gave me the f- like this first spark of, okay, I'm living in a country that its system has so many enemies, uh, good and bad. Um, but be- because of that, we are somehow um, always paranoid about our enemies and then obviously there was war so uh, I grew up during the war so we knew that what is that and why is that to some extent as as a little kid I remember mm, having the memories of 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 Saddam throwing like bombs even um, in Tehran so um, there was Always a little bit of stress going on in our yeah, lives. Yeah. Even as little kids, we could understand. I don't know what it yeah. is with the kids of 80s of, of Iran that we all grew up with the anxiety and the stress of, of early post-revolution and then the war. Yeah. And and um, then that airplane shutdown happened yeah. very early on when we were kids. So we, we grew up with all of these things and had this understanding that for some reason... Either our system is the enemy of other places yeah, yeah. or other places are the enemy of of our country. Uh, but I grew up in an environment that I never had the sense that our people are the enemy because my parents were were not repeating those those slogans mm-hmm. or uh, at least behind closed doors in our household, we were allowed to have our own values and thinking. And uh, my parents are not necessarily mm, religious mm. or or pro-Islamic republic. So especially my dad was always mm, reading books, being very open-minded. Um, I was never forced to, to wear hijab indoors. But those early memories always stuck with me. Another thing is that I always remember not seeing a photo of any woman on TV, like mm-hmm. the news. There was no a photo of, of any woman. And I remember the, the news coverage of everything United States related was very amplified, right? Their yeah. animosity or everything U.S. related was very amplified in the news, including the president and... Um, the president was was Reagan at the time, and also the Britain. But they were always talking about Britain, England, and the U.S. And they were always showing talking about Thatcher and Reagan, never showing Thatcher. <laughs> so I always assumed Reagan Thatcher is one person, is this man? <laughs> but so who is Thatcher? It, to me, it was just one person. That's interesting. For for years, yeah. I thought Reagan Thatcher is one person, and it's that man, President Reagan. Yeah. And it took years until I was like maybe 13, 14 that I realized, oh, there was a woman named Taj. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they never showed her face in the news, right? Because uh-huh. because of hijab, they yeah. they always censored her her look. Um, well, in- that, yeah, that's a detail right there. Um, <laughs> well, Jason, you're you're on the other side of the planet, uh, but you you come from an Iranian family um, that is living in California, not unlike a lot of Iranian families <laughs> in the diaspora, and. Um, uh, you and I are about similar age, so like you're coming of age, you know the the revolution and the hostage crisis, which is obviously a bigger deal here, has happened. The Iran Iraq war is happening. You have these overlapping identities, right? Uh, you're, you're an Iranian family um, in America, an American family with Iranian heritage. I mean, how did you negotiate between coming from this place that was now like an enemy and chanting death to America? Like, how did you hold on to that Iranian identity and, and think about, you know, what the Islamic Republic was? So, you know, I had um, an Iranian dad who came from uh, a large family. He had eight brothers and sisters. Um, and by the time of the revolution, three of those sisters 
uh, had moved to the U.S. And soon after the revolution, uh, his brother moved to the U.S. So I had a lot of interaction with, with Iranian people, but I also had, you know, a very white American family. My yeah. mom is from the Midwest. Uh, she was an only child. And so we were this kind of blended family living in Northern California. And, you know, the food, the celebrations, the culture were very much part of my life from the very beginning. Um, and the images of the hostage crisis especially, I think that's kind of my first understanding that um, the half of my family came from this other part of the world were really jarring for me because if you look at the coverage from 1979, 1980, it's a lot of burning of the stars and stripes, people, angry looking people mm. chanting death to America um, through your television screens as a three or four, five, six year old. Um, it just didn't make sense to me because this is not my experience of Iranians. Yeah. And I think that that was something that I grew up with um, through throughout school and high school. And it wasn't really until, you know, September 11th that I started to feel like, oh, other American people think of me as slightly different as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm on that other side. Yeah, of, I, got, you know? I got a funny last name. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. Got, My dad's got yeah, an accent, yeah. you know, all of that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I was always really curious. And we had a constant stream of relatives who would come back and forth. You know, one of the things that, that gets forgotten in all this, although the U.S. and Iran haven't had relations since 1980, uh, the diaspora here in the U.S. is large, you know, maybe as many as two million people. And goes back. I mean, I, I remember I have a bunch of Iranian American friends, as you guys know, and I was always surprised almost because we saw this as this you know, ominous place. They all went, I mean, it kind of stopped recently, but like for a long time, it felt like there was a lot of travel back and forth. There was know? tons. And, the, you know, part of that was that during um, the last decade and a half of the Shah, uh, during the... Um, the Nixon, uh, Ford, Carter years, there were more Iranian college students in America than students from any other country. Mm. So, you know, there was this kind of cross-pollination that had been going on forever. And then to to have that cut off and all of the the transportation and, and, and the flow of people going back and forth be kind of clandestine and quiet. Yeah. You know, if, if you went to any major airport, LAX, SFO, O'Hare, JFK, on any day between the mid-1980s until a couple of years ago, you would have seen dozens of Iranians getting yeah. on a, a, a Lufthansa flight or an Emirates yeah. flight or, you know, a KLM flight, stopping in, in Europe or in the Gulf and then heading to Iran. And this has been a common part of the experience for a very long time. We've never uh, had direct relations between uh, the government officially. Yeah. Obviously, you've been involved in, in all kinds yeah. of conversations with them that were uh, not on the normal sort not of normal, not normal, not yeah, normal. Yeah. Uh, but but the flow of information and communication among the people, as Yagi you know indicated, never really stopped. When did you go for the first time? I went in April of two thousand one. So right before nine yeah. eleven was my first trip there. I was you know fascinated by the place. I think people assume that it was out of uh, you know desire to connect with my roots, and I'm sure that, that that was some element of it. But, you know, like so many folks uh, of your and my age who were finishing college in the late 90s and yeah. the, the dollar was historically strong. It was very easy to travel. We yeah. had the opportunity yeah. to travel in ways that previous generations didn't. 9-11 kind of ended that in parts of the world, you know. But in that, you know, 96 to 2001, I went everywhere I could, yeah. and Iran was kind of the holy grail of destinations for me when I finally got in. I thought to myself, this place is fucking crazy. Well, <laughs> and so, I just kept wanting to go back. Yeah, I mean, you, so you're following your career and then, yeah, 544 days. And I was just telling you guys, I heard both of your stories yet again on the, uh, what, what I recommend to everybody, the, the oral history of Anthony Bourdain. But so you, you basically kind of write your way into a job, it seems to me, right? You're a stringer, essentially, filing stories from Iran, Washington Post, uh, um, you, you hitch up with. And I remember at the time being struck by, like, how clear it was that you were really trying to show this 
complex, multi-dimensional country to an American audience. You know, mm-hmm. like it, you, you're almost grabbing us, being like, "Hey, it's not just death to America chance." Like, right. and it's not to say it's all good or bad. It's just mm-hmm. like, what were you trying to up until the point when you were <clears throat> arrested? Um, what did you What did you think your mission was there as a journalist? What, were, what What was the Iran you were trying to show people? I think that was my m- m- the only value add that that I could make to the conversation. Uh, when I first moved to Iran uh, in 2009, after having traveled back and forth, you know, a dozen or more times in the previous seven or eight years, um, you know, I, I wanted to show Americans that. Yes, this country is very different than America, but the aspirations and dreams and fears of these people aren't any different than yours and mine. And actually, in a lot of ways, they're more similar to us than a lot of other countries who yeah. we're very friendly with. Yeah. Well, they, they're, we, a sense of exceptionalism. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's totally. a lot. There's there, a lot yeah. in yeah. common. Also, you know, very multi-ethnic, yeah. you know, mon- multi-linguistic country. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to... Um, to show that to a very general American audience. And I think that was kind of the secret recipe that I had that none of my other colleagues in the foreign media working in Iran could pull off because they hadn't grown up in the United States. They were all European, you know, or Iranian or uh, people who'd, who'd grown up in the Gulf. They didn't have that understanding of not only the context of U.S. Iran relationship, but the the enmity that was kind of baked into that relationship for the average American. I just wanted to strip that apart and rebuild the whole thing. That, yeah. that, that was my goal. Don't mean to be too personal a question, but like, you know, you're in a society in which women um, are treated differently in a lot of ways, particularly out in public. Yeah. If you were in America and you guys started dating, you wouldn't have to think about, is she covering her hair out and, you know, is there alcohol? Or, you know, right. Like, what is, what, what is, you guys were meeting and obviously, you know, starting a wonderful relationship, how, how did it feel to be in a, a different social context than the one you grew up in? On the one hand, you know, selfishly and immaturely thrilling, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other, you know, I, I think I'm a fairly empathetic person, and to see Yegi, who had just received her master's degree in English trans- translation, struggling through job after job where she was more qualified, uh, more ambitious, not getting, not getting paid and getting sexually harassed by one boss after another, it's infuriating. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it, it changed my entire perception of women's experiences in Iran. I understood that, you know, th- they are um, required to follow different rules than men, that they have to literally sit in the back of the bus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All of these things that are very evocative to to anybody who's paying attention, but then to, you know, fall in love with somebody who's who's subjected to that on a day-to-day basis, you feel it very differently. And I think, you know, I don't want to bring us too much to the current moment. No, we're we're going to we're gonna get to the current moment. But I would sure, say yeah. that, you know, you know, the the women have been leading this this movement, but there are tens of millions of Iranian men who feel that frustration of their wives, girlfriends, sisters, moms, daughters, who are just as supportive uh, and, and understand that um, this has been the wrong way for a really long time. So I, you said something, like, I, I'm going to actually break from what I was going to ask you next, Yagi, because the sexual harassment point is one that, uh, how endemic is that? It's unfortunate to say that it's very, the misogyny is very embedded in the society and and it's been completely um, okayed, approved by the system Mm -hmm. because um, if you have an abusing boss who wants to take advantage of you and and takes advantage of his power and position, you don't know who you're going to go to. Um, where you take your your complaint, like you yeah. can't go to the police because the man, the person in a position of power is protected. It's hard to go to your family because if you go to your mother, um, she is herself in, in a position that wants to protect you but doesn't have much power. If you go to your father, then these um, fights get involved, like... 
So it's it's a very complicated situation, but it's 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 terrible. I but, remember yeah. throughout the um, the university, throughout different different jobs that interestingly most of them in in the situation that this happened to me most of them were like government positions pe- people who had any p- power in in the system people who think that they can operate with impunity yeah yeah, yeah. you know well and i have to say like cuz this will uh, you know i'm going to do one more thing in the past but uh, this is worth i think bringing to, to the present like how much like trauma is is coming out in these protests. Like I'm just imagining decades of yeah. of impunity and sexual harassment yes. and how many 7-year-old girls, 5-year-old girls putting on their mother's hijab. Like I can't imagine the yeah. pent-up trauma that is exploding right yeah. now. 40 know? something years, yeah. right? 43 years of yeah. of gender apartheid and um and as you said misogyny and keeping women down and as Jason said literally force you to sit in the back of the bus or not having a voice or a say and these are just little examples in a big city like Tehran yeah. which everyone is educated and modernized and have access to social media and think about women in the smaller cities I think that's why this time around is a little bit different yeah. because you can see that women from Kurdistan are leading this thing because they yeah. have been through everything their own tribal pain and pressure um, on top of everything that the society and the government has dictated them yeah I think you know one thing that that I keep coming back to when we talk about these protests is that it's a it's a full blown national equality movement. Yeah. First of all, it's women. Second, it is ethnic minorities, whether it's Kurds, Baluchis, Azeris, religious minorities. Those groups happen to be overwhelmingly Sunni. Yeah. Right. It's all the subjugate, subjugated groups in Iranian society, which happen to. Uh, amount for probably 70% if not more of the people right yeah. so it's it's a lot of people with a lot of pent up frustration against it's artists the, it's it's writers it's journalists scientists it's scientists it's doctors who can yeah. operate it 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 affects all aspects okay, of well, the yeah, society okay yeah yeah let's talk about the the, the movement now and cuz we um um you know we've uh, your detention, right? You guys have talked about a lot, and 544 days covers it. Now, I will come back and ask you about that, but I, I think the conversation leads us here so interestingly. Like, the, it's interesting to me. There's not really like a leadership, right? It's it's just, just kind of this explosion of, of 40 years of mm-hmm. of, of pent up um, repression, trauma. Um, is that sustainable? Does there need to be like a leadership structure, like how how can a movement become a either an evolution of the regime or a revolution absent some who's going to negotiate with these people or who's going to you know uh, clarify what what is acceptable, right? Like when we saw the announcement, you know, about the morality police, which is obviously you know questionable in its own right and not enough, but like what is enough? Like what how how does this movement right. become political change or social change? Either uh, just throw that out there. I mean, look, I think that that if you were to ask people on the streets of you know Iranian cities right now, they would say that we're coming out because of our own grievances, um, and you know the the one of the mistakes of 1979 was not having a clearer idea of what it was that was going to replace yes, the Shah. Yes, exactly. And I think that that's very much um, a problem right now that needs mm-hmm. to be uh, dealt with. At the same time, I think that we're in the nascent stages yeah. of a revolution. Yeah. This could last for you know many months, many years. You know, yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that realistically, um, figures will emerge from that. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that the Islamic Republic has been overwhelmingly, you know, successful at over the years is snuffing out opposition. Yeah. So, you know, mm-hmm. if if these young protesters, women, others were to put figures forward, that's a recipe for getting those people killed, yes. imprisoned yeah. or exiled and yeah. put in a situation. So there's a tactical not a... reason not to have leaders because then yeah. they can be decapitated. I mean, exactly. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, what a lot of us are waiting for is, um, you know, 
some effective, credible voices uh, in diaspora to, you know, make it clear that uh, they have a um, a certain amount of uh, credibility and responsibility that um, that folks inside Iran could, you know, put some faith in as interlocutors between them and the rest of the world. I don't think that that's happened yet. How do you, um, particularly in the U.S., yeah. like how does the diaspora not be seen as, you know, this is an objective of U.S. foreign policy, but rather this is a part of an Iranian movement? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's very, very challenging, and it's a, it's a, a, a tough one. I mean, you dealt with the Iranian di- diaspora, you know, for eight years while you were in the White yeah. House. And pretty you, pretty fractured diaspora, yeah. Very much so. From and royalists to MEK to much more reasonable people in the, in this brand of spectrum, yeah. But yeah. To everything yeah. in between, yeah. And, yeah. and 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 you know, communists yeah. and yeah. atheists yeah. and people who support the regime and yeah. people who are religious and don't support the regime and people who, you know, have business interests that they would like to see yes. developed. I mean, yeah. so th- th- there's so much of that, and it, it's a it's a group with um, incredible. Education, incredible financial resources, yeah. incredible connections, yeah. and somehow we haven't f- figured out how to become a political force in this country. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's the the missing piece of it. Um, and you know, you've seen um, a shift. I mean, I think while you guys were in office, there was an overwhelming feeling that um, diplomacy, that uh, lifting of Sanctions in return for curtailing nuclear deal, or nu- nuclear program, making uh, inroads between the civil society in Iran, creating you know foreign investment opportunities. I wanted student visas too. All like, of that yeah, stuff, yeah. yeah. That was all very much supported six, seven years ago. It's yeah. not right now, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, we're I think in a different that world, yeah. we're in a totally different yeah. world, and so now it's how do we take some of those things like student visas, like you know. One thing that I've been talking to people about and writing about quite a bit is, you know, incubating civil society in exile. Yeah. You know, allowing dissidents who have already fled the country easy passage to the United States. This is what's missing from our conversation here. We don't have the human intelligence on Iran. You got a bunch of people. Yegi and I have not been in Iran. Uh, a month from now, it'll be seven years since, since we've been around. You, you won't find experts in Washington, D.C. who've been there any more recently than she and I. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so that's um, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And is there a problem, too, that um, I, I talked about this a bit a couple weeks ago because I saw this in Cuba. The, in Cuba, the, the government for a long time, you know, uh, particularly under Fidel, they, they had a strategy every time there was some unrest of opening a massive valve you know, oh, sure, everybody can go to Florida. You know, right. mm-hmm. um, they wanted the people to leave. Yeah. And, and and the, if you look today, I, I'm noticing more and more prominent Iranian. You know, people in film and art and sports, athletes, yeah, yeah athletes, mm-hmm. uh, basically leaving or mm-hmm. not going back. And and on the one hand, that can help you set up a kind of diaspora movement. But on the other end, then they're out of Iran, and right. the, the the prominent people are, are just not present in the street. Like, what's that balance like? Uh, I want to say yeah. one thing, and then I want to hear what Yegi has to say about it. But I think that right now is the moment where having them in uh, diaspora can actually make a difference. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we need to be going all in on supporting the aspirations of uh, of ordinary Iranian people right now and tapping into those voices um, a year from now, two years from now. Will have missed that moment. So you know, I think let them in right now. Yeah, yeah. Organize. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be like herding cats. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and then you know, figure out what's possible. Yeah. I think going back to your point about Cuba, I think the government in Iran would like to see um, the prominent Iranians leave. Yeah. Um, they don't have any problem with that as much as these prominent people can leave without any problem. Um, once they are outside Iran, um, the government, I think, inside is having so much problem and dealing with 
domestic issues that they think, okay, if, for example, Ali Karimi, who's a prominent soccer player yeah. and an um, opposition at this point and a very critical figure speaking against the system, if he leaves... We are not. We don't have to leave or deal with him anymore. So he he's he's gone. Yeah. So um, because they are trying to to kill the movement and 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 silence the people on the ground. So they prefer those those characters to leave currently. But um, you're seeing a lot of them not leaving, mm-hmm. standing up and saying, "I'm not going anywhere." I yeah. mean, I would say those are prominent f- figures in 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 who. In in some some sense, um, there are some political figures, characters, activists yeah. like like the famous blogger Hossein Ronagi, who has come out many many times and said, "I'm not leaving," despite whatever they put me through. And he just came out of fifty days of hunger strike. Um, so those are the people who have more political depth in their their fight against the system um and and what do you so because i've noticed you know it's even like film directors athletes pop stars who actually the regime might have once elevated you know particularly if they had international prestige you know Mm -hmm. you know now they're speaking against the, the the regime and um and it kind of leads to a place where you know, we, you and I were talking on the way in, but like you have a p- pretty incompetent, hardline, you know, quote unquote elected government, you know, fixed uh, for President Raisi. Um, you've got a supreme leader who's just, I mean, I mean, this guy's like barely hanging on and, and a pretty old geriatric clerical establishment. Mm-hmm. You've got, you know, a bombardment of disinformation mm-hmm. <laughs> from from the Iranian Regime to the the Gulf countries to Israel, U.S., Russia, everybody's you know, right. But there's something kind of dystopian, like in that description. You know, there, there, what what do you think it's like to be at the eye of that storm? As just if you were an Iranian girl, like, what is motivating that person to to continue to protest while also kind of just living daily life? Freedom. Yeah. Hope, hope for for getting to what they deserve, because um, as much as I'm sure the life on the ground is very difficult right now, people have been connected to the rest of the world um, as much as Internet and social media was available to them or is available to them. They have seen the opportunities that the rest of the world kids their age have. Mm -hmm. Um, They are very educated young generation mm-hmm. um so they they speak english they know how to use internet like everybody else they have youtube channels that they pr- create content everyone has a smartphone they know how to get um, around the government sensors uh, if they need to yes right, yeah. and and obviously they they know that they deserve a better chance of life and and it's I don't think at this point the younger generation wants anything except the sense of freedom in a sense that um, no one is coming to the street and saying, we want to have bars or discos, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. They are not asking anything um, romanticized or or too much. They just want to have democracy and freedom of choice of clothing, good education, good jobs. These are like very basic rights to to have and do you guys think you know this is obviously a huge question so i don't ask you to answer for <laughs> all iranians on this question so being the I, I, but like what would you know does this have to be a wholesale change in the entire system an end of the islamic republic and a new government or what if there did emerge from within some people who said you know what we we're gonna you know not just end the morality police we're, we're gonna do some and kind of overhaul this system to try to address these concerns. I mean, do, do you think there's a room for that approach or do you think this is just existential? I think that was what Rouhani and Zarif were trying That's to, yeah, to yeah. do or yeah. or at least pretend that they were doing. Or I honestly believe 
some of them genuinely some thought them they thought they that, yeah. would yeah. be able to to make such reform uh, under the IRGC or or the same supreme leader. Um, but that ship but is sailed now. That ship is yeah. sailed long time ago, and that's not what people want anymore. And and even even people I think realize that with some more modern forward thinking people like Rouhani and Zarif the change is not going to be making a real difference yeah. in in their lives so yeah. they are still the outcome of the same system yes. yeah. and at times they have to bow to the supreme leader and go m- move forward with whatever the hardlines uh, hard, hardliners ask for so people know that's not going to happen that's why they are asking for the whole change. The whole thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the the bet on the Rouhani years internally, and probably from where you you were sitting as well, was that you know these are people that we can deal with, and um, you know the amount of foreign investment and engagement that might follow on to this will make the situation uh, much more uh, malleable and potentially something that we can influence, which we didn't have ever before that. Yeah. We didn't have once we left the deal. We don't have yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, Everything kind of collapsed onto that, right? Because it was like internally, it was also at the same time that serious happenings at the IRGC is mm-hmm. flexing its muscles there. Then externally, Trump gets elected, so this bet on the deal gets torn up, and you know, there's no... Uh, there's no room to even test that proposition. And... And, and the other promise of the deal for normal Iranians was a better economic situation. Mm-hmm. So yeah. now, you know, I always looked at it and said, you know, having lived there yeah. and knowing that in 2009, when we, you know, faced the most repressive several months in, you know, 20 years before that, um, 2010, 2011, pretty good economic years for Iran. Right, mm-hmm. the the value of the Iranian real was very strong. Iranians were able to travel. You know, they weren't out in the street protesting in the same way. When the when the sanctions started piling up in 2012 and 2013, it was that economic prom- prom- promise. And now we're in this moment right now where the economy is in the toilet. The value of the real is one tenth of what it was when you guys struck that deal, hmm. yeah. right? And at that point, it was one-third of what it was before you started the sanctions. So yeah. over a 10-year period, now the value of the Iran currency is one-thirtieth of what it was yeah. a decade ago. People who are a little bit younger than Yegi, you know, people who are in college uh, and thinking about their future, don't have any money, don't have any prospects, don't have the ability to go anywhere, and have no freedom. The regime has zero answers for any of these problems. So I think that I think that you know it's done. So here's so my own peculiar overlapping identities, which uh, are not as interesting as yours. But like I, two of them are someone who's incredibly sympathetic with uh, democratic movements, uh, and someone who was once a national security official. So as a person who is very sympathetic to democratic movements, I do look at this and I think. This is game over, right? Like this mm-hmm. regime's never putting this back in a box. No. I mean, the stuff we're seeing is not when you're seeing like twelve year old girls just standing up to authority. Mm-hmm. Like this is they they will never win back those people at some you know, in whether it's one year, five years, or ten years, like this place is gonna change. However, the national security official of me looks at this situation and thinks, You've got a theocratic uh regime that is not gonna wanna go quietly. They have Almost a nuclear weapons capability. Mm-hmm. They have, they do have neighbors, uh, whether it's Saudis or the Israelis, who have very significant interests in how this situation plays out. They're kind of a party to a, a, an actual war that is currently happening in Ukraine mm-hmm. with the kind of drones and stuff that are supplying to the Russians. And I kind of look at this and I'm like, well, wait a second. Yes, the democratic, you know, activist in me is like, these people are going to win in the three, five, ten year time period, but how is there not going to be a, a war mm-hmm. or, or an, a civil war or just something horrible 
you know, in the next couple of years. I think mm-hmm. there's, you know, like th- these, they're, they're, they're the, cause it's not unlike the Rouhani thing. Like, e- if, even if we assumed all the best about Rouhani, the, the environment around that was not going to allow that to happen, mm-hmm. right? And, and how, how much do you worry about h- how do we even navigate through the nuclear issue and the regional proxy wars and the Ukraine conflict and how this intersects? Like, w- what do you tell, like, a Biden administration um, about h- how to how to avoid the war that might derail the democratic progress. Yeah, you know? no, I mean, I know it's something that 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 um, that they worry about yeah. because, you know, you and I both yes. talk to yeah. them about that regularly. Yeah. My first uh, instinct on that is uh, to tell them, you know, to, t- to think for themselves, right? Yeah. You know, we don't need to take Saudi and Israeli intelligence on how to handle Iran. I mean, yeah. we're completely capable of it. And by on the way, our own. on our own, and all the more reason to listen to these recent arrived diaspora Completely. people you're talking about. And we can create yeah. that space. Yeah. Uh, and I would um, encourage them to to do more to uh, to fast track creating that space and and draw as much guidance from uh, from the ample number of, of people um, who are already in town and those who will soon come, rather than relying on third parties. With their own um, ulterior motives, uh, to, uh, in terms of how U.S. policy on Iran should go, I'm very worried about the internal fissures within Iran. I've been worried about it for a decade. Um, you know, you have. I'm not. I don't think of you know uh, separatist movements that that some people, especially in the regime, talk about as a challenge. I don't like think Kurdish the Kurds. And, yeah. yeah, I think that's bullshit. Um, those are Iranians. Those are people who've been in Iran for thousands of years, and they want to maintain that Iranian identity. Um, what I'm more worried about is the divide between um, people like Yegi and people in the morality police who arrested people like Yegi. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, her calling me after being arrested by them one night and telling me, you know, these women... You know, they wanted my boots, uh, and at the same time, they said, if I want to look like this and if I want to live a Western lifestyle, there's no place for me in this country that I should leave. And you know, the the more secular thinking, modern thinking Iranians want to e- e- deny the existence of uh, more you know regime supporting people who still exist. I hate to say it, I don't know the percentage of it, yeah. but th- there's still some people there who for whatever reasons, are wedded to that system. And everybody's going to be trying to feed those fissures, right? You yeah. Know, all these external actors. Yeah, uh, I think the, um, I have been worried for years about a civil war, to be honest. Yeah. I think that's kind of imminent because um, yesterday they executed a 23-year-old um, whom apparently was not participating in a protest or anything. He was home with his sister and his mother, and these hardliners were in their street, bad-mouthing women, and this young, ambition um, athlete guy went out and, and started getting into a fight and trying to silencing them because yeah. because they were saying anti-women um yeah. Mm-hmm. Stuff and that's where the fight started. And according to the to the regime, which I'm sure they are manipulating the story, he beat or killed two Basijis. So these were dogs of of yeah. the system, and he got into a fight with them, protecting his mother and and um, sister. And they they executed him after only 23 days of arresting him. So imagine how fast the trial and everything yeah. and the appeal, everything went m- move forward. And and they executed a guy who was just protecting his mother and, and sister. So and this, may not have done anything at all. At all. Yeah, nothing. This, yeah, you know, nothing. I mean, he just got into a verbal fight with them. Or supposedly. Or supposedly yeah. Yeah, well, just, right? like, just like you were supposedly like As using a, avocados over to, the other right. team or something. Yeah. So this is the beginning of a civil war yeah. between the group that Jason said between more secular Iranians and and Basijis or or more more system like way, people. In a way, it's already happening. And, yeah, and it actually, is happening. The, uh, like it's something occurred to me in hearing both of you talk about this is obviously the, the 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 trauma of that kind of sexual harassment and and repression of of, of, of women just generally the apartheid system, and also like the men. You know, I'm trying. I have daughters. I'm trying to imagine 
what if the trauma for if you see your sister or your your wife or your daughters get sexually harassed or mistreated and you can't do anything because you might be executed if you do right. something. I mean, you can't put that in a box, you know. Right. I, it's a zero sum situation. Yeah, right? like it's you, zero sum. It's just it's just the, that and so yeah yeah. I, I wanted to ask you this and. and 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 actually, this whole conversation I, I think has kind of you know clarified for me how I want to ask the question. So you know, you are in prison and even in prison mm-hmm. by your own government, right? Um, along with Jason, um, treated horribly, kind of dehumanized in how they treated you. Um, then you're released um, while he's still in prison. So the person you love is still in prison by your own government. Um, and then you have to leave um, and suffer the kind of pain of, of exile. Um, and I, I have to think, you know, um, w- when you watch this, these protests and you think about having to have left Iran, you must have thought about what is the Iran you want to return to someday. Right. Um, and you, you guys have a, a young child. Like, I'm sure you would like you know, to to have your family experience Iran. Like, what is, do you think about that? What is the Iran you would like to go back to? So, um, first, let me say that I left Iran in a very traumatic way, as you said. Um, um, I During Jason's ordeal, I felt constantly betrayed with my own people, with my own government, um, just because I married a guy who is half foreign, right? Half American. Um and then I had to leave without any heads up or anything. And I'm even grateful for that because I could have been still stuck, stuck yeah. there, right? Um, Thanks to Ben and Co. for that, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> bit, bit player, but yeah. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone in the Obama administration for not leaving me behind. Um, which I know how hard it was. Yeah, um, it was crazy, actually, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, but all of this um, makes me have very, very um, um, strong feelings about my country. Yeah. And and at times there are moments that I think to myself, um, if this regime is gone, I'm going to go back in a heartbeat, get a yeah. f- plane ticket and fly back tomorrow morning. Yeah. There was a time that I even told Jason um, that I'm going back tomorrow Um Fuck everything um, during the Trump administration because I was so angry with with Trump's policies. I was yeah. like, it's still at the end of the day my country. Yeah. If there is a war, if if they they throw a bomb on my people, I'm gonna go and do something yeah. like on the Just ground. Be there with them, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I'm one of them. I never saw myself as anything except an Iranian people, right? Um, but. Um, yeah. Now there, there. I, I also have, when I see the violence of this regime, how brutal it is to the people. I think to myself, if there is one single person from this regime still around in Iran, I will never step back into mm. that soil yeah. until that last person is removed. Because these are violence. These are not human beings. Yeah. These are, these are dogs. These are. These are enemies of of anything that the Persian culture ever stood for, like poetry and happiness and love and 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 humanity. All those great things that we are always boastful about having them, yeah, right? Yeah. So I don't know. It's a very mixed feeling, and I'm sure I'm not the only one having all these mixed feelings. I'm sure many of us in the diaspora have these thoughts of. Um, sh- should we go back anytime soon if we are allowed? Um, should we not go back? I still apparently have a case in the Revolutionary Guard open against me. So uh, I don't know. It's um, um, some of us are bound to the to the politics of the place that we were born. Yeah forever uh, and Iranians are very political people and doesn't matter where they are the the politics of of our homeland always 
haunts us, I think, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. Cubans are like that. Yeah, I, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't know, for example, a Somalian is like that or an Indian yeah, is yeah. like that or or uh, let's say someone from somewhere else is like that. But, or, yeah. yeah, or or even you guys, like if as an American, mm-hmm. if you lived outside America, would you um, feel like the politics of your country is hunting you every day? Um, mm-hmm. Or... Yeah. Um, I I don't know, but but um, for me, um, I feel like I have one foot out the door, always be ready in a bag mm. to to go back. But do I want to go back? Will I ever feel safe? We sometimes joke, who's gonna go back first, Jason? I won't let you go. I go back, and if it is safe, and he jokes and says, um, actually he doesn't joke. He's very serious. I won't let <laughs> you take our kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's. It's well, complicated. That, the the last question I want to ask then is, um, yeah, for for both of you, to, part of what is happening, I think, as an uh, outside observer and someone who's worked in Iran, known and really loved Iranians over the years, is there there. This is about like what does it mean to be an Iranian, right? Because mm-hmm. the identity that you they try to beat into you is being Iranian is. Islamic Republic, hijab, death to America, death to Israel, death to Britain. That is Iranian identity. That's what they and, are trying to yeah. indoctrinate yeah. us with. And they were. it's interesting to me. That's what I always tell Jason. Despite all the regime's effort, look at me. I, not, I am supposed yeah. to be an outcome of the system. You're the failure of that project. Exactly. <laughs> so, Their project yeah. was completely failed. It yeah. didn't work. Even with the, the next generation of kids who are like a decade younger than me, yeah. they even failed more. They fail worse each generation. Exactly. So what is it? Uh, what is... What is Iran? <laughs> you know, um, oh, to me, Iran is this beautiful land of of uh, really kind people. I always say that uh, something we have in common with Americans is that we are also very family oriented, um, like Americans. Um, when it's weekend, everyone wants to be home, celebrate, cook food. Um, we have this beautiful tradition of the last day of Nowruz, which is called the Day of the the nature, which we kind of similar like w- summertime or or like Memorial Day, like barbecuing outside. Yeah. Um, the weather is nice, so everyone is outside playing with their kids, eating outside. Uh, but people can't even freely sit outside in in like a park or something with their family, with their wives, with their daughters, and feel relaxed and free. Yeah. That's what everything this regime has taken away, stolen from 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 people. Restaurants cannot have seats outdoors because this regime is worried about assembly of more than two people, right? Yeah. Um, but but to me. Uh, um, mm, Iran is this beautiful land of of good food and kind people mm. and and poetry and art and really good films yeah. um, that has been taken hostage, hijacked by by this regime. Um, I think for me, you know, it's um, it's slightly different. You know, having grown up in a family and and had. Um, some access to the culture and then to go there. Um, you know, it's a real complex identity. Yeah. Right? It's yeah, not, it it's is. not one it thing. Is. Yeah. You know, we are different people behind closed doors as we are from public. We're incredibly hospitable people. Um, you know, we tend to be um, really polite superficially. Um and then talk a lot of shit. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm not letting out any secrets. People know. People know this about us. Um, you know, we are um, we're complex beings, and I think that's that's part of having you know been around and had a concept of ourselves yeah. for as many years as we have. I mean, I I think about my dad, who you know was born in Iran, lived there until he was 20, and then came to the U.S. and you know. He was kind of mercurial and a total character, not perfect at all, but really lovable, yeah. fun, smart, curious, 
hospitable, uh, inquisitive. Those those are the things that I think are are most interesting and 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 um, represent us. You know, when I went to Iran, I, I remember thinking, and this this was all the way up until I was arrested, having traveled there for almost a decade and a half. Anytime people would hear in your voice that you weren't from there, they just want to engage and know about where you're from. Yeah. yeah. You know, they and they love then, knowing that Jason is a foreigner. And it's one of the funniest stories is that Jason's full name is Jason Adams. So his middle name is Adam, right? But Adam in Farsi means human being um, <laughs> af- after like the, yeah, yeah. the, the prophet. Yeah, so thing. even everywhere we went, the member of Basijis or the member of the foreign ministry, they were always asking me, mm, Back in the days, they would call me with my middle name, Miss Salehi. Is your husband really American? I'm like, yeah. So why is it that he's like double human being? I was like, it's because he really is double human being. He's such a good person. And then they would love it. They were giving him. I remember we were walking in Tajrish Bazaar, and as soon as a um, a fruit seller or like a salesperson heard that he was talking English with me. They, they gave him free food or gu- yeah. free fruit or, or I think vegetables. I just looked hungry, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you always hear about this abiding curiosity about Americans. And, yeah. and, and not just yeah. Americans. Yeah. And, and, you know, literally. Especially Americans. But, you know, taking you by the hand and saying, hey, Ben, yeah. you know, you're not from here. You're coming to my house. Yeah, and yeah. then 12 yeah. hours later, you're you know. Dinner and, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's. it's um, Drink their homemade alcohol like Arab yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean it, it's a special place and I, I think about it these days when people ask me like why we should care and I'm just like you know Iranians are worth it yeah the history is worth it yeah. the food's worth it the women's struggles are worth it the yeah. art the Persian rugs the poetry the four seasons the mountains the desert yeah. you know the Persian Gulf yeah the caviar. I mean, the list goes on and on. The pistachios. Yes, the you know? saffron. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, look, I love this conversation because actually, I'm, and I loved how we ended because there's so much just like, why should people care? Not just for the geopolitics of it all, because it's an amazing country full of amazing people that deserve a lot better. Um, and so as I know you guys would implore our listeners, keep paying attention to this. Like, however you can express solidarity to the people of Iran, particularly the women of Iran now, like keep doing that. Yes, please. Um, keep raising your voices. Get to know an Iranian. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they may, there may be more of them showing up in your neighborhood if you're in certain places. Maybe yeah. your dental uh, hygienist, yeah, your yeah. real estate agent. Uh, by the way, your lawyer. my dental hygienist is an Iranian. Of course. <laughs> and uh, let, let's just say like she, she loves the conversation because it's entirely one-sided. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's a very Iranian experience to have your tooth cleaned by an Iranian hygienist because they just talk the whole time. And at first I feel bad because I'm like, oh, I can't answer. And I'm like, actually, she's fine with that because like, I'm getting her view on everything. You know. That's great. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, well, Thanks, great ben. to see you. Thanks for Thank doing this. Thank you for this. having yeah. us. Okay, we're very pleased to welcome back to Pod Save the World David Miliband, the president of the International Rescue Committee, the IRC, uh, which provides aid to people around the world facing humanitarian crises, um, working in uh, 40 war-affected countries uh, and in refugee resettlement and assistance programs uh, across the United States uh, and and around the world, really. Um, Before joining IRC, uh, Miliband uh, was in a series of positions in the UK, including foreign secretary, um, where we overlapped for a couple of years. Uh, David Miliband, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Ben. Nice to be with you. So uh, you, you you guys have recently uh, kind of put out a, what I would call a warning. <laughs> You've been issuing uh, very prescient and uh, sober uh, and insightful warnings in, in a number of ways for years. Um, but but, but I, I think what's striking is you talk about how this slide that continues to happen in different parts of the world where the IRC is active, from, from fragile to kind of failed states, and, and, and the, the model of humanitarian aid that comes in after the kind of unraveling, uh, that, 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 that model is kind of broken. Um, and that we need to think a, a, a differently about how to affect this cycle that is creating so much mass displacement around the world uh, and creating so many humanitarian crises that then the international community has to kind of scramble together um, to uh, to create a response and kind of mitigate damage. Um, wh- how do you, we do that? How, how do you look at the 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 prevention that needs to take place to stop um, the the kind of explosion of um, 
of, of not just migration, but uh, the humanitarian crises that we've seen in the last decade or so? I mean, let's start by looking at what it is we're trying to prevent. What do we mean by humanitarian crisis? And essentially, the watch list that we put out takes 67 different data sources, takes information from our 200 field offices around the world in those 40 countries that you mentioned. And it draws up a list of the 20 countries most likely to suffer from humanitarian disaster in the next year. So you're right to call it a warning. It's also a description. And it's increasingly a call to action. Because as you say, we can better preposition people, medicines, money, but we're running to catch up. And just to give your listeners a, a sense of the scale of the catch up that needs to be done, the UN says uh, that 339 million people around the world are in need of humanitarian aid to survive. Uh, the 20 countries that we cover in our emergency watch list account for about 90% of those people. So 300 million of them in those uh, countries. Uh, in 2014, so just eight years ago, uh, the figure was 81 million. So you can see that this is a galloping uh, yeah. tide, really. For, well, a tide can't gallop. It's a rising tide yes. of, of uh, misery. And it's being driven by three things. It's being driven by conflict, which is now the preeminent driver of humanitarian crisis and extreme poverty. More than half of the world's extreme poor now live in fragile and conflict states. It's being driven by the climate crisis, which intersects with conflict because of the resource stress that it creates, but it also creates misery on its own. So the climate crisis is being uh, experienced in the poorest countries in the world today. And then the, the the kicker over the last year has been the consequences, the economic consequences of Ukraine because of its impact on food prices and energy prices, interest rates globally, but also the long-term ripple effects from COVID. So those are the drivers. Your question is, well, how can you, how can you get in there? And we highlight three ways that we, that the world needs to change its approach. One is it, need, it needs to break the, the cycle of crisis. And that means at a micro level in the treatment of famine, and we can come in, come back to whether or not and when it's right to use the word uh, famine. But essentially 600,000 people around the world today are at the international phase classification five, which means famine. So it can be at the micro level, or it can be at the more macro level, where at the moment, the humanitarian and climate movements really occupy totally separate spaces. They don't work properly together. They don't map risks together. They don't combine finances together. So one is to break the cycle of crisis. Secondly, is to protect civilians in conflict. Civilians are now the people who in the main get killed in conflict, not soldiers. 34,000 civilians killed last year. Uh, the, the Russian tactics in Ukraine are purely to pummel civilian infrastructure today. So we have a massive issue around the world that we can't get to the people in need because of the tactics of combatants. And we say that NGOs like us, but also UN officials are afraid to call this out. We say there needs to be an independent uh, office for the promotion of humanitarian access. And the third thing that we say is that the world needs to manage global risks much, much better, be they pandemic risks or climate risks. And all of this is to say that uh, we're we're living in a time when risk is being globalized but resilience is happening at the national level. And that is the gap. That's the hole that the clients of organizations like the IRC are falling into. And I hope that this report, as well as helping our own internal preparedness, uh, is, a, is the kind of call to action that the world needs. So I want to break uh, this into pieces because there's a lot there. I do think everybody should check this out. Uh, this watch list is put up by the IRC. I mean, just the data alone is... I mean, that, I was going to actually quote that stat to you, that 80 million to 340 million in just less than a decade. Um, it, it's a stunning number, but not, sadly not surprising. Breaking your kind of prescriptive answer in a few pieces, I guess I'm going to start at the, the, the last piece, which may be more like your old foreign secretary hat as much as your IRC hat. Um, it, it strikes me that like when, when you were foreign secretary, you know, when I was coming into the Obama administration, the architecture was creaky, but but when there was something brewing like in, in Sudan or South Sudan or in the Horn of Africa, you still kind of turned to this UN infrastructure, you know, the Security Council and, um, you know, the, the existing pieces of the international system to try to mitigate it, to put guardrails around it, to, to prevent things from getting worse, and then to get humanitarian access. It That has kind of broken down uh, in the last decade to the point that like, if I look at a bunch of situations, 
from Myanmar to, you know, any number of places in Africa, uh, you know, the, the Security Council is kind of not even like nobody even goes there anymore. You know, um, what what is politically the 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 what set of tools are needed when we see a conflict brewing as you could have, you know, as, as you could see in Ethiopia, you know, a couple of years ago, um, uh, you know, uh, as you can see in, 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 in other parts of the world, where do you turn to kind of stop things from getting worse? Do we, is it just a matter of like making the existing infrastructure work better? Or do you think like we need to rethink the tools that we use to prevent places from falling into to chaos and conflict? Yeah, that's a really interesting way of putting it. I'd say a couple of things. First of all, you're right that things have changed. Uh, I, I date the change really to 2005, six. That was the high point in some ways, both of the democratic tide of the 1990s and of what was called at the time, the responsibility to protect. You'll remember yeah. that. This was the idea that uh, governments that abuse their own citizens had responsibilities that the international community could hold them to account. We've seen 15 years when demo dem democracy has been in recession around the world, and so has global responsibility. So that's where you get this mismatch between the international risks and the uh, and the national um, resilience. Now, this is th th these are this is politics uh, that's been going on at the international level with the rise of impunity. You and I have talked about that. Um, before. So that's the first thing that's going on. The second thing that's going on, though, is that the tools of diplomacy that were developed for relations between states don't work for resolving conflicts within states. Sovereignty is being used today as a shield against accountability. Yeah. And although there's one very important example of a war between states, the Ukraine crisis, we've got 54 civil conflicts going on. And essentially, to your question, have we got the tools? The answer is no because essentially the tools that regulated relations between states are being used to stop the resolution of conflicts within states. You can just think about Syria, you can think about Myanmar, uh, you, you can think about a whole range of uh, countries. Now, the, the thing that strikes me is that the political fragmentation, which is the first element that I pointed to, the rise of autocracies, the rise of what Anne Applebaum calls the bad guys, and on the other hand, secondly, this uh, dissolution within states, this conflict within states, they're feeding off each other in a very dangerous way. And it's all being exacerbated by the global risks that I've described. So I think it is right to think about how you rebuild the international system. There are a couple of elements of that that I think are straightforward. And then the rest of it is very, very difficult. Uh, one element is that the like-minded do need to work much more effectively together. The rebirth of some version of the G7++ um, on the of, of those countries who are willing to defend not just liberal democracy at home, but the rule of law abroad, that's very important. Secondly, uh, I would say that one of the things I've learned in my eight, nine years at the International Rescue Committee is that untended humanitarian crisis is a driver of political crisis and political instability. Now, those are two things, relatively speaking, that are straightforward. The much more difficult, and, and by the way, it speaks to some a theme, both those points speak to a theme that you've emphasized, which is engaging with civil society, yeah. thinking about the plurilateral system, not just the multilateral system. In other words, thinking about civil society as well as uh, governmental level. The, 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 beyond that, though, how you build a, a system of international relations that's fit for the interdependent world is um, very, very challenging when you've got rogue actors who are willing to defy the rules, be they states or non-state actors. And yes, the Western world has to get its own act, its own house in order. That, that much is clear. Uh, yes, there are global imperatives for engaging with China and others on issues like uh, climate, where there is real shared interest. But then you've got a large range of more political disputes where it's much harder to figure out how to get the leverage. And that's what we see every day uh, when uh, accountability is in retreat, uh, when humanitarian aid is in retreat, and when uh, politics, in a way, is in retreat. Yeah, no, but, you know, even the steps you outlined, you know, recognizing how many harder steps are, could make things better. You know, as my old boss, Brock Obama, would say, like, better is good, even if it's not, you know. Um, so so I think the like-minded uh, working better together and, and the, the kind of uh, the efforts to to, to to, to take these crises more seriously because of how they can evolve is spot on. One of the things you guys talk about uh, a bit in the, in the report 
um, you know, is is trying to shift to more people focused approaches, right? So, for instance, like the development banks, very government focused, right? You know, you stabilization plan with X government, you know, price subsidies, um, you know, and development programs themselves. Uh, often focused on on government, you know, uh, c- capacity building, getting into ministries. Um, talk about whether we can do more. You you know, you mentioned my interest obviously in civil society, but like, how do we get resources to the people on the ground? You know, because like one of the things the critiques you hear, even of the IRC, right, is just the, there are these big organizations, and 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 there are these. If you're someone on the ground in, you know. Uh, it, 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 well, in any one of these places, um, sometimes you, you, it takes longer for stuff to reach you. Like, are there things that can be done to make the existing resources more efficient and just getting to the people who need them faster? Yes, definitely. Although I, I, I'm bound to say that's not a criticism that you would level at the IRC since of, of our of our 20,000 staff, you know, 19,000 of them are local people. If you, you oh, know, no, no, no. Yeah, in I Afghanistan, mean, and, yeah. but it, it's interesting. I mean, more the whole apparatus, like I, I, people I say it, the whole apparatus. Just, yeah, not you guys. But I, like I get the, it. I, yeah. I, but yeah. it, it's an interesting point because there is uh, you will find some organizations that will will fall into the trap of describing the heroic global aid worker, whereas uh, the, the heroic aid worker for the IRC is an Afghan who is working to defend their own community in Afghanistan yeah. or someone in Syria who is working in their own community in northwest Syria and can't get out of uh, that area. So I think the first thing is transparency. You've got to demand that organizations like mine are utterly transparent about where the money goes, who's employed, how it's, how it's organized. Secondly, you've got to resolve this contradiction between on the one hand, wanting to be local, and on the other hand, having compliance mechanisms that squeeze the life out of any local organization that wants to partner with us. So there's a compliance versus, uh, versus localization uh, challenge. The third thing that I think is really, um, really important is that you uh, understand how the UN system works with or without local engagement. And when I say UN system, maybe it's better to say the international system. You see, you're absolutely right about the international financial institutions. They that there's a massive agenda, Larry Summers has been onto this, about increasing the spending power of the World Bank, making sure that they are actually leveraging the um, funds that they've got. And of course, part of that comes down to how their stakeholders behave. Those are stakeholders like your country and and mine who sit on the governing boards. But it's also about how they engage with civil society, because larger and larger tracts of the world are ungoverned space when it comes to governments. When we work in northwest Syria or northeast Syria, we're working in areas that the Syrian government doesn't control, and in those areas that it does control, it doesn't do what want to do what <laughs> what many international organisations want it to do. So I think there's a real change of mindset, and that's why we talk about a people first approach, because it's not an excuse that you can't engage. There are some examples of something called the National Solidarity Program in uh, Afghanistan that work through local um, institutions, not national ones. And surprise, surprise, the local institutions were far less corrupt than the national ones. Yeah. So I think there yeah. is quite some quite good uh, practice there. It can't be done on its own. And of course, where you have governments that are willing to engage, you've got a chance, much, it's much easier to make a difference. But here's where I come back to where I, where I started. The numbers of people in extreme poverty in stable states is going down, despite COVID, despite everything. The number of people in extreme poverty in unstable, fragile and conflict states is going up. That's the scissors effect that we yeah. have to deal with. Uh, that the international system has to deal with and these problems don't stop where they where they originate they will move the people will move and the problems will move as well yeah no i think it's it, it's a really important point and the the one of the things you said you you've said in your work and it, it's it, it's in the report here is that there's this convergence of crises right the climate crisis is now interacting with the refugee crisis which is interacting with these political crises and you guys are kind of at the tip of the spear of the response and what you're seeing is it's not just one causation and yet there are these kind of siloed communities right there's a kind of a climate community and people focus on climate mitigation then there are people who focus on migration of peoples and then there are people who focus on yeah. How do you, as one of the biggest organizations that's just dealing with the impact of all these things, is there a way to thread together the kind of international uh, community of people that includes NGOs, it frankly includes increasingly like private sector has to get involved in this, as well as governments. How, how do we start to think of these as, as, as fully connected in one ecosystem rather than like, you know, we have conversations at, at 
cop about climate migration. And, you know, we have conversations somewhere else about migration because of a war, you know, uh, when in fact, a lot of those wars have a climate crisis. I'll I'll tell you the way we try and do it. And there's lots of lots of organizations out there. We do it by starting with the solution rather than starting with the suffering. And what does it mean to start with the solution? It means behavioral scientists being part of our teams, not just humanitarian aid workers who work, who, who go down to the absolute ground level of malnutrition in Somalia or Mali. We've just finished a 27,000 kid study in Mali that turns upside down the way in which malnutrition is treated. How do we do that? By starting at the level of the poorest family and asking, okay, you've got six kids, you're never going to be able to get to the health center that offers treatment for severe acute malnutrition. What would it mean to diagnose and treat malnutrition in your own home? And we've shown how a 96% recovery rate can be achieved if you start from a community-based solution. So number one, you've got to start with the uh, solution. Number two, you've got to find uh, those funders who are willing to think in new ways, because a lot of the old bureaucratic systems are stuck. Some of them will come in the private sector. Some of them will come from foundations. Some of them will come from governments that are willing to um, uh, think imaginatively. Thirdly, and I think this is, we were, as it happens, talking about this today in our leadership board, you've got to think about scale solutions from the beginning. A boutique solution that is very costly per person is never yeah. going to be scaled and is not yeah. going to work. And so we now try and build into our program design the question, how do you scale this? Let me give you an example. The first thing we will do in any emergency is to give out cash. That's It's not complicated. The poorest people are poor by definition, and they need cash. You can get cash to people, sometimes where there's phones, sometimes where there's no phones, sometimes where in Eastern Ethiopia last month, I was seeing us giving out literal banknotes. And you build from the needs of the people. Where cash isn't needed, where it's not cash, where it's health or education, you build around that. But I think that those that building in of scale solutions is absolutely key. Otherwise, we're going to be struggling. Now, people say to me, well, you're a big organization. You just said this. We've grown from being a $430 million uh, NGO uh, less than a decade ago to now being a $1.5 billion NGO. What I'm interested in, though, is not just how much revenue do we have. The fact that we helped 31 million people last year, that is the real proof point that we built programs that don't just have high impact, but that they can reach big scale. And too often, the humanitarian sector, often the charitable sector, has boutique solutions that different funders want something new, whereas actually you've got to build in scale from the beginning alongside the starting with the the solution with the the range of skills that I described. I I think that's exactly right, because if you can't replicate these approaches and you're trying to reinvent the wheel each time, the cost and time and bandwidth just goes up and your capacity to say, hey, this worked here, this, let's do this over here, um, that, that creates all kinds of efficiencies. Well, I, I, I want to end on a, you know, a note, this, this is going to air heading into kind of a holiday season, obviously. Um, what would you say to people at home like, who care about this stuff, are a little numbed by the scale of it? How can they be involved? How can they support efforts to mitigate humanitarian suffering? How can they be part of the solutions that, that you're talking about? Yeah. I'll tell you what I uh, always go back to. If you look at the statistics, you get depressed. If you think about the people and see the people, you have hope. And so I really invite people to go to the rescue.org, which is our website, and just see what our staff are doing, see what our clients are saying, because there you'll see a solutions focus. If you care about uh, maternal and newborn health, 60% of the women who die in childbirth die in our settings in fragile and complex states. We'll show you what we're doing uh, about it. If you care about the war in Ukraine, We can show you what it means to get to Kharkiv 36 hours after the Ukrainian military say, "Okay, civilians can get into this um, into this uh, war zone, into this former uh, into this former war zone. If you care about child malnutrition, 80 percent of acutely malnourished kids around the world are failed by the mainstream system. We can show you how you can flip that. And I hope that uh, people obviously uh, can can support us that way. Also, if they're in America, We are now uh, pretty much the largest refugee resettlement agency in America. If you're a refugee who comes to America and the Biden administration has really boosted the number of uh, refugees who are allowed to come in, it'll probably reach 50,000 next year, maybe even 65,000, which is the target on on route to 125,000. Those refugees need buddies in the 28 offices that we run all around the country. If you're an employer, give those people a chance of getting a a job. Uh, There's there's local action that is part of this. And the final thing I would say is that there is a, the Pope talked about um, 
the globalization of indifference. I don't think that's quite, I don't know if you're allowed to argue with the Pope on Pops of the World, but uh, I, I think the way you put it, actually, which is people people worry that they have lost agency. Uh, yeah. My, my learning, my point is that governments are in retreat from big problems, but that's the time that NGOs and philanthropic sector and the private sector need to march in and address those problems. And that's what we're trying to do. That gives me a sense of um, momentum. It creates momentum in our organization. And it would be wonderful to get some recruits and supporters and uh, idealists and ideas uh, from your from your listeners. Well, look, I think that's a great note to end on. People should go to rescue.org uh, to, to, to learn more about these issues. And there's a lot of information there. But also, I encourage you this season to think about how you can help uh, in whatever way. One important way that David mentioned, um, you know, being in a community with refugee resettlement, you can make an enormous difference um, uh, by being welcoming, whether that's, you know, a job, whether that's uh, companionship, whether that's just support. And you will be better for it, by the way, because I've never had an experience in my own life that that, that was not, <laughs> which I wasn't massively enriched uh, by engaging with uh, uh, those types of communities. So, David, thanks so much for joining us and for the work that the, the, the twenty and to all your you know people in the field. We we uh, we're grateful to them too. That's very nice of you, and uh, happy New Year and all that. <laughs>